Everybody, welcome, Max. How you doing? Doing well. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. I uh, definitely look look forward to this. Uh, this is episode number seventy eight of Tech Sales Insights, and I'm uh, excited to have Max Altschuler with us today. He is VP of Sales Engagement at uh, Outreach, and uh, as you'll find out, he's had a catbird seat in the whole evolving sales tech stack, and certainly Outreach uh, be, being uh, one, one of the best in that space. And he's uh, coming to us live today from Scottsdale, Arizona. So is it uh, breaking 100 there yet? It is. It is. <laughs> so you gotta, if, you got, if you're going to golf, you got to get out early. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it's pretty hot out. <laughs> there you go. And uh, we are sponsored today by Outreach. Uh, we've got a lot of the uh, sales community advisory board members and companies that use Outreach. And uh, still certainly more opportunity for others to leverage Outreach. Uh, Outreach is the first and only engagement and intelligence platform built by revenue innovators for revenue innovators. Outreach allows you to commit to accurate sales forecasting, replace manual processes with real-time guidance, and unlock actionable customer intelligence that guides you and your team to win more often. I've uh, been really impressed with the customer traction. 19 of the 25 fastest growing public SaaS uh, companies are customers, over 70% of the Cloud 100, over 5,000 customers. So really impressive. So if you want to um, you know, improve on the sales side, use Outreach to manage your reps, uh, actions, and insights. So uh, pretty powerful stuff, huh? Hell yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the title uh, today that we have that we'll be getting to later is uh, How Revenue Leaders Should Think About Consulting and Angel Investing. Uh, as always, uh, we're also brought to you by Sales Community. Uh, right now, we've got a free year uh, membership promotion going. You can uh, maybe Tucker will pull it up. You can do uh, salescommunity.com slash May free. So uh, a lot of people have been taking advantage of that. So definitely encourage you to if you want to uh, learn more and sell more and uh, network with a, a bunch of great folks. Uh, sales Community, the home of the CRO or those that want to eventually be a, be a CRO. So um we we're trying to figure out in our in, in our prep how we first met. I think it was uh, Ed Al, Ed Callanan who uh, introduced us. So I'll have to circle back and thank him. Uh, I've really only known Max uh, recently, probably for less than a year since uh, Outreach has been active as a sponsor with Sales Community, and uh, also I've been a uh, investor with uh, Go to Market Fund, which you'll find uh, find out more about. Uh, I can totally vouch that Max is a great person to. Uh, to work with has a high say do ratio whatever he says he, he definitely does and uh has an amazing following and uh, uh i love always uh working with him because we come from uh, different worlds which uh, i think is probably a great thing uh, he's also the author of hacking sales uh sales engagement and career hacking for millennials he's a widely recognized thought leader on sales and technology he's been published by the harvard business review forbes money and more uh, he was also named a top sales expert by both Salesforce and Inc. And uh, more, more importantly, Scott Barker says you are the man who does it all. GP and founder of GTM Fund, VP of Sales Engagement and Outreach, two-time author, father of two, and a pretty painfully average golfer. Yeah, well, I'm not even average yet, I don't think. We're still <laughs> losing too many balls to be average. Uh-uh. Well, what's your index? I don't even have one yet. I'm shooting, uh, you know, my lowest I ever shot was a 91. Uh, That's decent. I'm probably averaging uh, like somewhere between 98 and 105, depending on the course. Yeah. And I started my first round out was March 3rd. So I'm still I'm still pretty new. Wow. There you go. That's good. So you're probably low, low, low 20 is probably good. Uh, good candidate for a member guest. Uh, anyway, so why don't we, why don't we jump in here? Uh, maybe uh, tell us a bit more about your professional background. Yeah, so I started my career at a company called Udemy, online education company. Uh, built the supply side, sales side of that business uh, through their CD Day and B rounds. Uh, they IPO'd uh, last October, November. Um, uh, parlayed that into starting a community and media company called Sales Hacker. Some of the stuff we were doing at Udemy was really hacky. Uh, we were one of the first customers of a sales engagement of the sales engagement space. Uh, one of the early uh, companies in that space was Tout App. So uh, my face was plastered all over their website, and we were doing we were kind of like the uh, power users for that. We also built a SDR team in the Philippines um, uh, in order to kind of save money there. So the whole like thesis around Sales Hacker was 
generate more revenue using less resources. Uh, we were the startup going against the, you know, these Goliaths that had a ton of capital uh, and headcount uh, behind them that we didn't have. So we had to figure out how to, to grow fast and do what they were doing without the resources that they had. Uh, it turns out that that was a prevailing problem throughout the you know, tech ecosystem. Uh, so I started the media company more as a way to help startups figure out their sales process, eventually kind of morphed into a way to uh, make all sales companies modernize their sales organizations through technology, through kind of, uh, you know, mul- you know, a millennial workforce just came into the workforce. Like, what do you need to do with them? There were a lot of different things that were changing at the same time. And sales all of a sudden had all these amazing tailwinds that were going to help this profession grow. I mean, when I was, when I got into sales, it was kind of taboo in like the early 2010s, even to be in sales. Like people would say, Oh, that's salesy. Oh, you're in sales. Like, okay, whatever. And then all of a sudden 2015, you're starting to see Ivy leaguers and people with MBAs go take SaaS sales roles over investment banking roles. Cause you can make the same amount of money, if not more right out the gates. And you're working 40 hours a week instead of 120 and getting seizures and, you know, being overworked just to what make partner in 10, 15 years. It really, you know, um, it feels like our generation says, okay, that's not worth it and calls bullshit on that lifestyle. So it's great to see sales have this, um, I think generational shift now where, you know, people actually want to be in sales. Yeah. And I also am very passionate about uh, the profession because as somebody who was terrible in school and, you know, I was, I was very much in the C's get degrees camp. Like, let me just get this piece of paper and get the hell out of here. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure what my options were. And then there are folks that, you know, can't afford to go to, to college or whatnot. And sales is that great equalizer, that level playing field that lets everybody in and True. you make as much money as uh, equating to how hard you work and the sky's the limit really. So, um, it was a, a pretty phenomenal profession when you think about it like that. Yeah, fan, fantastic. And, uh, you know, our, our outreach has been amazing and definitely uh, look forward to hearing more about that. So uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about outreach. Yeah. So uh, sold Sales Hacker to Outreach in 2018, came in as the VP of marketing, ran marketing for about a year and a half, uh, pivoted into this role that I'm in right now called VP of Sales Engagement. Uh, it's a, mainly a position uh, of like an evangelist evangelizing our category, but also working uh, inside of a lot of our larger strategic deals. Uh, especially uh, with cloud companies, so BV, BVP, Cloud 100, uh, those types of companies. Uh, so I'd say I probably about split my time like 50% marketing, 50% sales. And um, it's a fun role. Uh, I, I enjoy it a lot. I, uh, you know, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur at heart. So I need to, to focus on a lot of different things. I like being a jack of all trades. For me, if I was in the same thing, you know, uh, same area or silo of the business every day working on, kind of two similar projects, I'd probably get bored. So having uh, this role within outreach and then also the GTM fund on the side allows me to, to um, really leverage my creativity and, uh, and I guess overworkingness or willing to overwork. And, uh, and so that's been a lot of fun. And yeah, I, I, I don't ski or snowboard or binge watch Netflix. So my, my work ends up being my hobby. And now that I have two kids under two and a half, that's the, the other time consuming piece. That's great. And uh, obviously you're private, but what can you say about the um, kind of size of outreach in terms of uh, you know, revenue, employees, customers, other things like that? Yeah, what you see on LinkedIn Insights is probably pretty accurate. So uh, I think it's a little over a thousand employees, maybe even 1,200 employees. Uh, you know, our, our growth rate on there is pretty accurate as well in terms of how fast our headcount is growing. I can't get into revenue conversations, but it's a very healthy, strong business, uh, you know, that, that, uh, is executing at a high level. Yeah, that's great. And, um, I, I would imagine kind of as things have morphed traditionally, you were selling to probably operations, marketing, maybe inside sales, but now as a, a kind of VP of sales role has evolved into more of a CRO role is a CRO becoming more of your, you know, kind of ICP decision maker. Yeah, I think we've always we've always tried to focus on getting that top down alignment from the CRO. Uh, I think when when outreach started, it was very much thought of as like a pipeline generation uh, tool, and is now transformed in kind of a into a uh, organization wide platform. So now you have engage, guide, and commit. So 
you know, that's the entire kind of uh, journey or life cycle of a sales uh, process. So you've got pipeline building, you've got uh, selling and closing, you've got managing sellers and pipeline builders, and then you've got uh, leadership that can forecast out. Uh, you know, I think, you know, at a lot of companies, marketing is also heavily involved. So I'd say, you know, marketing, customer success, sales, like your entire revenue organization should be bought into outreach. Yeah, totally. And what about on the uh, partnering side as you uh, kind of do your go to market? What do you mean? Uh, partners that you work with, kind of joint go to market, kind of things like that. Yeah, if you go to the integrations page on Outreach, you can see kind of the, the full ecosystem of partners. But, uh, you know, we a lot of companies will plug us into a, a CRM. So if you kind of look at the pyramid, you'll have like CRM. You might have some data providers like uh, Zoom Info, Cognizant, Lead IQ, Sales Intel, Seamless, you name it, Lusha. Um, there's quite a few out there. And then you'll have Outreach. And so, you know, we're the system of action. So you've got your database. You've got external contacts, then you've got your system of action that sits on top of that. And we've created our, your system of intelligence on top of that, which is our guide product um, and our insights product. So now it helps you understand, okay, well, you perform this action, this, you run the sequence, you send these emails, you make these phone calls, you get data from those actions. This was positive sentiment reply. This was a no reply this converted into X, Y, and Z, that data creates insights and those insights allow you to improve the action. And so next time you go to do the action, you know how to improve it. And it's a flywheel that's created inside the product. So you're getting better over time instead of running the same actions that don't work. Uh, so that's what we built over time. And now you've got the three products, you know, it's been one, it's been one product for a very long time, just the engaged product. And now you finally have uh, guide and commit as well to give you that that intelligence layer uh, that feeds the the next best action. That's great. And uh, obviously, you're c continuing to hire. Um, if I were a recruit, uh, what would what would you tell me about outreach? Why I should work there? I mean, it's um, first and foremost a, a an amazing company that's growing quickly. That's top of the food chain in terms of you know our category. Uh, we've raised money from the top three CRMs in SAP, Microsoft, and Salesforce. Uh, we've got the largest valuation. Uh, I think we've got um, an amazing executive team. Uh, we're a four-time Cloud 100 company. Uh, we're consistently a leader in you know all the Forrester G2 reports, all that kind of stuff. I think second thing, um, you know, TAM is important. How much room do we have to run? That's the past. What does the future say? How much room do we have to run in the future? Salesforce has 200,000 customers. Uh, they represent 20% of the market. So that means there's a million companies uh, on CRM. That that market, uh, last I heard, was growing like 15, 20% year over year. Uh, and Outreach has 5,000 or so customers, uh, I think, last reported publicly. Um, I think the entire sales engagement space maybe has 9,000. So we're still, you know, first pitch, first inning, second game of the season you know it's, it's not yeah. we're 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 not anywhere close to to being done yet so i think you know outreach as a whole has a lot of room to run and then again you know we're, where we are today as a pretty um strong company with with great growth over the years was all on the back of that first um product and now we've got multiple products and so uh i'm as bullish as ever uh on outreach and in the future yeah, I can totally vouch from the discussions I've had with uh, CRO CEOs. Uh, de definitely an amazing company and uh, huge, huge potential for sure. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit about uh, GTM Fund. Yeah, GTM Fund was um, a cool little side project started <laughs> in uh, 2021. Um, you know, running a media company in Sales Hacker through 2013, 2018, I had a really good cash flowing business but not a great upside business because it's a media company, not a SaaS company. You're not getting a 10 X multiple. If you get acquired, you're probably getting like, you know, three X EBITDA or one X revenue or something like that. So, uh, you know, I had to diversify and I had the cash flow to do it. Um, so I said, okay, well, you know, I should start investing in SaaS, getting involved with early stage companies. So that I have kind of a basket of those, you know, SaaS multiple SaaS valuation type companies and start, start planting those seeds uh, now. 
so my first check was in an outreach uh, pre-seed, very good valuation. I was early uh, advisor in Gong, Carbon Health, and a couple others. Um, so I ended up building a pretty nice basket of companies that were all valued in a um, couple billion to a couple hundred million as of you know last year. We'll, we'll see where they're at now, but still, still pretty good. I was able to harvest yeah. some of that while they came up. But um, got a reputation for also being able to have a good eye for early stage deals. So that's one piece. Second piece is building Sales Hacker, built an amazing network of VPC level sales marketing customer success leaders. A lot of these people said the same thing to me. Hey, I saw you got into XYZ deal. How do I get access to some of these early stage companies also? Yeah. Because I want to diversify too. If you've got two VPs of sales who left Salesforce in 2013 or something like that, one goes to Zoom and the other one goes to Achievers. Well, one person might make $25 million over the next few years in stock and the other person makes zero. So you, you want to be able to diversify because like when you are that executive, you're putting all your eggs into that four year basket of the company that you're working for and nothing else. So uh, in, um, in late 2020, AngelList came out with rolling funds and essentially gave you a way to build a VC fund without having to manage any of the back office. You just have to raise the capital and deploy the capital. We always had really good deal flow. I said, okay, well, I don't need to go find a bunch of high net worth individuals. I just want to go find a bunch of GTM leaders. I'll raise a million dollars from, you know, 25 to 50 of the GTM leaders and we'll go put it into 10 or 20 companies and we'll help those companies and, you know, positively affect the outcome of those businesses. Cause we, we know the playbooks, we have the candidates, we have the deep, we have deep benches of people we worked with that we can plug into these companies who are going to, you know, execute at a high level. So uh, set out to do that, ended up with 150 GTM leaders and 6 million raised last year uh, and deployed. And then this year we're already at, I think, 14 or so million um, raised from about 220 GTM leaders. Uh, we've got um, participation from uh, Tiger Global and Bain uh, Capital, uh, David Sachs from Kraft and a couple other GPs from some big funds are in as well. So that's been very helpful in sanity checks and things like that. We've done... In, a, in, this, in the 16 months we've been around, we've done about uh, 102, I think now, checks in the companies. And the other thing that I think like is really interesting about the GTM fund is, um, aside from raising money from GTM leaders who've been there, done that, and you know can help you hire, we've placed CMOs, VPs of sales, AEs, product marketers, demand gen folks, you name it. But aside from that, our check sizes, because our fund size is small, our check sizes are relatively small to other VCs. So we end up being complementary to other VC firms instead of competitive. So we're in on a lot of you know the top tier one VCs uh, rounds, and they'll bring us in on deals because we're not taking their chunk. Uh, so if a company does a $10 million Series A, Sequoia does six, three goes to Pro Rata, a million goes to, to Strategics, we'll yep. take 250K of that strategic tranche, and we'll be able to participate with the other VCs versus if we were trying to do two or $3 million checks in that example, we wouldn't be able to get into that round. So yeah. um, it's worked out really well for us so far. Uh, pretty high on the model and um, yeah, we'll see what goes from here. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've not, I, I should have counted before, but I think I've done probably at least 10, 10 or a dozen deals. And that's probably just, just since the fall. But you know, what, what, what I like is that you've already done a lot of the due diligence. You've got a great summary. So you get kind of the company's value proper, the numbers of the customers, and you can kind of, you know, very, very quickly figure it out. And then uh, from an administrative perspective, you know, kind of you're, you're, you're clicking, you know, going through the whole angel list and, you know, sometimes that's, you know, the hassle all the paperwork everything else just it makes it so easy and then you just do the wire and you know it's it's pretty seamless and uh you know very very efficient and then the other add-on which hopefully is okay to say you also have the uh you know spv so you might be doing the investments but then sometimes you'll kind of pass the hat and just say hey they're also yeah. opening uh up this you know for extra if anybody else wants to invest and then you know you're also getting into from what i see deals that you know typically otherwise would be closed but because you're going after a you've got a relatively small dollar amount any of the companies are happy to have you know your gtm fund group but also the you know any of the lps in there because they know they can help you know a, a lot of different ways so um yeah. it's, it's really unique in, in terms of what that is and then the um the uh, website i assume is uh, gtmfund.com yeah 
Yeah, so Tucker, if you want to, uh, you know, post that, and I assume there's something on there that people can click and say they're interested, or certainly anybody wants to send me an email, I'm ha happy to make the uh, introductions. And uh, should we give a shout out to uh, uh, to uh, Paul as well? Paul and Scott Barker. Uh, so Scott's been my right hand man now uh, through kind of the the late days of Sales Hacker through outreach uh, for the past three years, and uh, now GTM Fund. Uh, and then we've got. Um, Paul Irving, who we brought on, we hired, it was actually an old friend of Scott's, played rugby together in high school. And um, Paul's been phenomenal, a uh, phenomenal asset to us. Awesome. Actually, I played in college. I have to connect the dots with those guys on the- uh, Yeah, the, uh, they were a big time, yeah. On the rugby side. Uh, so we've got as our uh, title topic, how revenue leaders should think about uh, consulting and angel investing. Um, so, uh, obviously GTM fund kind of goes, you know, hand in hand with that, but you have, um, you know, folks that are, you know, working, working full time that may want to kind of tip their toe in the water, helping in non-competitive situations. So, uh, maybe talk about the consulting side first, and then we'll talk about angel investing. So on the consulting side, any, uh, words of wisdom? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, especially in this day and age, uh, with everybody being remote with you know, the amount of startups that are coming up and getting funded, which, you know, I think is going to slow down a little bit, but isn't going to stop. There's about a quarter trillion still in VC coffers that are, that that's going to go out over the next few years. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of these, uh, you know, proven leaders with multiple years of experience have, you know, said experience that these early stage companies need and want, and they, they can do that in an advising capacity or consulting capacity. I think the first thing you need to do when you when you take a, a role as a you know a CRO, CMO, VP of sales, whatnot, is make sure negotiated in your contract that it's okay yeah. if you do consulting and advisory on the side. And you know you should. I mean, everybody should be on the same page. Everybody's everybody's mature, adult, whatever. Like, obviously, don't over like like overfill your plate so to speak, because the most money you're going to make on anything is on the equity or cash on the thing that you're focused on full time. Yeah. So like your CRO role or CMO role is your main thing. That's the thing you're going to make the most on. Now, all the other stuff that's outside of that is, is great for a little extra here, a little extra there. You want to you know pick up a couple lottery tickets on some early stage companies that you're advising. Fantastic. On the consulting side, you know, ideally, um, you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket, like all in one revenue stream, but you know, you should negotiate a, a, a salary and a contract with a company that's going to get you paid enough so that you don't really need to do a lot of consulting for, for short term cash flow. Um, for me personally, I don't really do any consulting for short term cash flow. I only do advising for, for upside. And then you have to think about it like an investor. I mean, your time is money. So put a dollar amount to your time and, think about it accordingly. So, you know, would you do this for X amount of upside? Yes. Okay. Then like it's worth doing. If you wouldn't, then like don't spend the time on it. So you have to think about any opportunity you take as a, an advisor or a consultant as if like a VC is putting a check into that mm -hmm. company, you know, would you put your money into this? No. So why are you putting your time into it? So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's a great way for, uh, folks to be diversifying right now. I think like there's a limit. Obviously, don't go and get like 10 advisories on the side at one time. But if you want to advise a company for six months, you get a eighth of a percent or a quarter percent, uh, no cliff, monthly vest, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, maybe that's good to go work with, you know, one or two companies at a time. And you have like a, a, a upfront, you know, a uh, very clearly defined, you know, roles and responsibilities doc or email that's just like hey you can call me whenever <clears throat> i'll pick up we'll talk for a half hour or whatever just send me an agenda beforehand you can send me an email with bullet points i'll get it done for you i'm not rolling up my sleeves i'm not doing the work this is just strategy stuff and advisory because i've been there done that and i've seen this play before i'll make introductions to folks for you that's all well and good but like a lot of this stuff isn't time consuming like most of the advisories that i've done in the past have been exactly that and maybe that's because the value is a lot more of my network, uh, right. you know, nectar stuff. But a lot of my advisories haven't taken me like much time at all. It's just like, hey, <clears throat> send me an email, bullet points, what you need from me. I'll get that email. If we need to get on a call because I need to ask questions or we need to talk through something, we'll schedule it. 
We're not going to have like set calls. If I don't, if we don't need to get on a call, I'll just knock out the things that are in that email. Right. Send me as many as you want. I'll let you know if it's too much. Oftentimes it's a lot less than you think it's going to be. They're doing, they're busy. Founders are doing other things, but when they need you, you're there. And a lot of times I've worked very little for some companies, but the things that I've done have been so impactful that it was worth it. And then, you know, you plant your seeds in down times, you harvest them in up times. A lot of those things that I've done in 2015, 16, 17, I was able to harvest and see the fruits of that in 2021 and 22 and valuations were high. Now we're going back into a period now where it might be time to plant seeds and then we'll go through another market cycle where it'll be time to harvest again. So you should be thinking about that. Totally agree. Yeah. I've, I've done, you know, similar to you, you know, a lot of these, you know, advising consulting, as you said, just, you know, a, a little favor here and there, especially if it's, you know, over top to a, uh, you know, exec that you're trying to sell to and you, you do it in a nice way, just can be a huge, huge uh, value for sure. And then selfishly for the individuals that are doing the consulting or advising, it's a great way to get exposure to those companies because maybe something, you know, one, two, three years down the road, they're looking for somebody as CEO or CRO or CMO. Then you're kind of in a catbird seat, knowing the company. Company knows you, and that could be a potential next job for you as well, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, obviously, you don't necessarily tell your existing company that's what you're going into it for. Hey, um, and also, I should say, um, yeah, everybody watching along, uh, feel free to uh, comment and ask any questions. Uh, we can not see you. You can see us or hear us. And uh, we've got Tucker behind the scenes as always that'll uh, kind of post those and we will do our best to get to any questions or comments. So feel free to uh, post those accordingly. So um, yeah, consulting and advising, certainly great. And um, you know, especially if you look at it, uh, you know, you've got a lot of the you know, CEOs of the biggest public companies are on boards of other companies and you know, similar, you know, I think a you know, similar analogy to you know, everything that you just said. Um, so now what about, uh, angel investing? You, I think covered a lot of ground when we talked about, you know, GTM fund, but, uh, what, what else would you add there? Yeah. I mean, a a angel investing, um, you really need to do your diligence. I wouldn't just like hitch a ride on, uh, on the coattails of a, a, a another firm or anything like that. It is good to co-invest with tier one leads and things, but there are plenty of times where I'll see a deal in sales tech get funded by like a decent firm. And I'll be like, that is a terrible deal and a terrible valuation. Like, but, but it's because I have that insider knowledge. Right. So, you know, it, I always wonder, even in the deals we're doing sometimes, like, what am I investing in like HR tech where somebody who knows that space is like snickering in the background? Like that's ridiculous. Um, so it's, it's really about, you know, staying in your, um, area of subject matter expertise uh, is important and just like do deals in that area where one, you could be, you know, helpful to affect the outcome positively. And two, uh, you are, um, you understand the space to do the diligence the right way. Yeah, that's great. Um, we had uh, Peter Bell on a uh, uh, month or so ago, who's uh, on our advisory board and he's also uh at uh, Amity Ventures, but he had uh, what he calls the five M's in terms of evaluating companies, uh, market management model, momentum, magic, and then I'd add, I'd add on you know, valuation. But I think a lot of times, you know, it's really easy to get sucked into the sexiness of a company and you have to kind of take a step back and say, okay, I'm objectively, and I'm, am I making a, a good, thoughtful kind of decision? Do you find that? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I mean, there's um, a lot of times the story gets funded, not the not the product. Uh, and so, or, or you know, uh, I, I think, you know, especially in the early days, it's really just about the team. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, so anyway, so great uh, perspectives there on uh, advising, consulting and angel investing. Uh, so moving on, uh, you had a cool post uh, floating in the ocean on a vacation somewhere. Uh, where was that? Uh, Exumas. We're down nice. in the house. Uh, yeah, it's good to, good to unplug uh, as our first our first vacation in a while. Um, we just moved to Arizona in December. My wife was uh, sick for a little bit. Then we had some family in town. So like we were we were due for a family trip. This is our first trip with two kids. Yeah, we had our our 
boy seven eight months ago now so we're starting to figure out like what we what we like to do when we're on vacation and yeah. uh and kind of what the what the formula is so um we did atlantis for a little bit not not really our cup of tea uh really cool but you know, we're we're like I'm drinking green juices. Like we were ordering green juices in from outside the the resort every day. Like I, we're we're just like healthy people. It wasn't really our our food or anything like that. And then I'm more of like a small boutique resort type of guy, not a big resort person. Oh yeah, Atlantis is a zoo. Yeah. Then you yeah, got the, exactly. you got the the battle royale just to even get chairs. I mean, it's 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 uh crazy. yeah, it wasn't wasn't our cup of tea. But Bahamas is amazing. And uh, uh, Mel from Speckett, who's a portfolio company of ours, uh, she's from there. Uh, so her family's there and she lives down there, you know, uh, part of the year. Um, so it's good to see kind of um, her and her family and friends and stuff like that when we're down there. And then uh, so we've got some like local touch, which is nice. And then we uh, we rented a boat for a day and uh, trucked out to some clear water and just hung out, drank some rosé and smoked a cigar and had there some go. food, uh, some local food and uh, hung out with the family. It was nice. Nice. Rose, Rose all day. Yeah. Uh, you also did a post on uh, removing folks from LinkedIn. Is that because you were uh, maxed out? No pun intended. Yeah. 30,000 30, connections and they don't let you add anyone else. So then you got to purge. And, uh, you know, it's 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 um, time consuming. It's annoying. You have to do it like one by one unless you use some kind of some kind of app. Uh, it's not that hard to do. I mean, like I think on that post I put like Anybody who has like just random programming languages or lead gen services or all caps or no profile picture or like a anime, whatever weird profile picture, NFT, uh, or just like logo, all those are, are easy, easy outs. Um, so then it gets tougher after that. And like, I, I probably only made it through like the first 500 and then I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta go do something oh. else. Maybe that's a, uh, a feature or something outreach can come up with. <laughs> LinkedIn doesn't let you do any automation. And honestly, I don't think that many people have that kind of problem. Like yeah. I've got 60,000 followers on there now. And before followers, there was, I think it was just connections. So like, I, I don't know. No comment. We'll see if gotcha. LinkedIn, LinkedIn always promises uh, product fixes. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm still waiting for this thing. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going up. All right. And you had an, another great post on uh, interviewing your parents. Yeah. Yeah. We had a scare with my dad and uh, I didn't know if I'd ever hear from him again. So I, I was like looking for voice mails and things like that to hear his voice. And then I remembered I, uh, I interviewed him for a podcast that did called career hacking, which was a really good podcast series that I started while I was, while I was focusing on sales hacker, just on the side as like a fun project. But um, my dad's always been kind of like my therapist also best friend rock uh but like mentor in a lot of ways and um he was financial advisor uh he is a financial advisor but uh you know it's it's kind of like a money therapist so you understand like people's goals you understand what makes them move and it's a it's it's a mix of a sales role uh you know a therapist role and then you know understanding the markets and things like that so it's been a, a good person to have on my um, in my corner but it was great to be able to go back and listen to that uh, podcast in that moment. And then uh, since then, everything's gotten back to normal with my father. So that's, that's been great. But in that moment, it was kind of like, oh, man, maybe I need to, to go be more, a little more proactive about this. And yeah. I think uh, it's something that other people might want to do as well. Yeah. So maybe even doing a, a video, right? So that way, then, you know, next to yeah. the kids can uh, see or know what their kind of th thoughts and belief beliefs yeah. are. So um, kind of on the business travel front, I know you've been getting out and about with the outreach and then you've also been doing some uh, local events with the GTM fund, correct? Yeah, we're doing uh, GTM fund slash outreach dinners. We did uh, San we had like 46 people in San Francisco at Roca Core a couple weeks ago. We had another 30 or so at uh, Ainsworth Midtown in New York. Uh, we'll get out to Boston. We'll get out to Austin. We actually did, we did a, Kind of more like informal Austin one with thirty some people at it. Uh, where do we do that one? I don't know. Scott Scott was the I think it was Eddie V's or something like that. Scott was there. Um, but yeah, I'd like to get to to you know a couple of our bigger cities with that: Atlanta, Denver, uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Boston, Chicago, uh, L.A., Palo Alto, Seattle. 
So we'll start, we'll start doing the rounds on those. Um, you know, it's, it's time to get, to get back in person and we'll talk more about this, I think in the next, you know, 10, 15 minutes, but market downturn, what are the things that you're going to be doing differently? What are the things you need to, you know, step on the gas on? What are the things you need to pull back on? I definitely think one of the things that you need to, you know, make sure you're, you're continuing to do and put budget around, especially some of the, the larger companies like us is getting out, seeing your customers, because that'll be a budget that a lot of companies cut. And I think that's like, that's a, a, that's a big lever in winning deals is like being on site, being present, being in person, shaking yep. hands, you know, uh, breaking bread, that type of stuff. So, um, you know, I, I'm going to stay out there as much as I can, uh, and be on the road and be talking to people and, you know, hearing what's going on and listening to the customer. And I think like, I think voice of the customer is more important than ever before. I think that the <clears throat> understanding what's going on in their walls, is important optim and then like that even leads to like re-optimizing your icp and the personas you're going after so there'll be a downturn there'll be some businesses that do just fine or even like even well through a downturn so can you focus a lot on those companies in terms of bringing them in as prospects or expanding them as customers and then maybe looking at some of your other customers that are not doing as well and saying like okay well like these are the companies we need to we really need to be good partners for them right now we need to make sure like the ones that are currently customers we're giving them, you know, price breaks or whatever we need to do to keep them and, you know, make sure they're happy because when they come out, they'll remember that and they'll be, you know, customers for life. But maybe it's not a good uh, pond to go fishing in for two or three years while those companies are cutting everything. So you can kind of rejigger your ICPs there and, you know, voice of the customer is really important for that. So, uh, you know, leads to leads to companies that are, I think, the, the ones that are agile right now we're going to win yeah. um obviously there's a lot of other things that go with it but it's part of ex good execution in this market yeah absolutely i do a uh, just started doing a um post a couple of week on uh, linkedin called uh, i might be old school but uh just for you know things that i see every week that are that are just crazy but i think this whole topic around face to face you know it would be the same thing i mean i'm again i might be old school but you know as you just said you know there's this you know nothing that can replace that face to face and I just worry, especially with this younger generation, that there's something that's kind of lacking there. They don't kind of wake up and think, okay, hey, if I can get on a plane and go see somebody, that that's really going to help. It's kind of like, hey, the easy way out is, is kind of doing zooms. You know, how do you, how do you at outreach kind of get you know get around that? Yeah, I mean, I think like there's a, a generation of folks that is comfortable on Zoom and is fine with this and wants to live wherever or whatever. I think you know. Uh, you're, you still have to find a way to get in person once in a while. Uh, you know, that's all, that's all well and good. Maybe you don't need to be in an office, but yeah. you're still going to lose a deal to the person who's built a better relationship and has, has gotten that FaceTime and has done the work to figure out, okay, like what is this person interested in and, and how do I get them, you know, in those rooms? I mean, customer dinners, if you do them the right way, I mean, what's better than that? If you can do like a customer dinner where it's, let's say 12 to 20, people and you've got one quarter of the folks in the room from your company one quarter of the folks in the room are the happiest customers and then the other half are prospects you're going to come out of that with like some pretty happy people they're hearing from you meeting you they're hearing yep. from your customers who are pumped they're talking to each other about their problems they're gonna have a good night they're gonna have a good time they're gonna come out of that with a good good feeling towards your company that's that's so valuable. You can't replace that on Zoom or anywhere else. And we've seen that. We've seen through the pandemic that like, people have tried, and it's yeah. it's not. We revert to this. This is what's happening. And you know, your your might be old school series is great considering you're doing it from a pirate ship. So <laughs> you know, you're really you're really dressing it up today. There you go. It's my uh, br brother-in-law's in uh, or Orlando with a bit of a, a Disney yeah. theme. Full 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 disclosure there. It is. It um, is a giant but uh, of the Caribbean theme there. There you go. So, kind of with the downturn or flattening, kind of whatever you want to call it, kind of how how has uh, outreach uh, kind of pivoted or changed messaging or uh, any anything on that front? Yeah. Um, when we were doing the prep, we were talking about kind of you know how do you sell the value for outreach, and I was like, well, it's interesting because the the conversation we have today is probably different than the conversation we have a month ago because the markets changed and, you know, we have to listen to our customers. We have to understand what's happening in these markets. And, you know, I think you pivot to a place of, of highlighting the efficiency that outreach drives. And I think for other companies, they're going to need to do the same thing. 
And you have to have, <clears throat> you have to have as few links in the chain to efficiency as possible in your story. So, you know, there are some companies that might struggle because they'll say like, oh, well, um, you know, when I talk about efficiency, I talk about like, how are you going to help me save money or make money? And ideally both. And, you know, some companies in some areas and some categories might be like, oh, well, we help retain or we help keep employees happy. And that means they stay. And that means that this happens. And that means that this happens. And then like you make more money or you don't lose money and having to ramp these people. And like that's a tougher, like that's a tougher way to, to build that argument. Um, then if like a, like a company like outreach where it's like, well, you know, we've done case studies before there's a median increase in they had 21% increase in pipeline uh, driven using outreach versus the status quo. That means you could hire 21% less headcount and just use outreach and get the same amount of output productivity. So what does that cost you? Like on a hundred employee on a hundred sales rep company, 21% more reps, if you're fully baked 150 K a rep, that's like 3 million bucks, you know, outreach is probably charging you a couple hundred thousand net net. You're saving two point something million dollars. Like that's a pretty easy story to relay versus the, Oh, we gotta, we gotta kind of get you there. Um, and it's, and it's a lot, it's a lot clearer. It's a lot more rooted in, uh, you know, ease of uh, ease of belief or execution than some of these other stories. I mean, like, you know, the, the, the tough part is like when people sell us conference sponsorships and I used to do the same thing, they'd be like, oh, well, you know, there's a, what's, you know, what are you paying for the conference sponsorship? Okay. It's 15 K. Well, what's your average deal size? Well, it's 30 K. Okay. Well, like we have 500 people coming to the conference. So if you get one deal, then you made your money back. Well, yeah. I mean, like that's an easy exit. You can walk through that on any, on anything that you do, but like, show me how that's been done before. So you need like, you know, case studies and, and things like that, that yep. can highlight it and back it up. It's not just like, Oh, I'm saying you can do this. So it's done. It's like, no, no, no our customers are doing this and, and not just any customer, but it's, it has to either be your peer group or like your aspirational peer group. So people who are in the same area that you are today, same type of business, same growth rate, same headcount, things like that, or ones that are maybe a year or two ahead of you. I think that's important also. If I tell, you know, Verizon that this cool 50 person company had these results, they're going to be like, that's all well and good, but like we have nothing in common with them. Right. I, you know, if I tell Verizon that AT&T had these results, they're going to be like, oh, okay, that, that's interesting. Um, you know, same thing, vice versa. If I talk to a hundred person company and I tell them that, you know, this 250 person company that's growing faster than you had these results, they may be like, oh, wow, that's awesome. We need to do those same things. So that's an aspirational peer group. So you want to make sure you have, you know, uh, <clears throat> good stories, customer stories, case studies, things to back up, you know, the efficiency uh, numbers as well. Great. Um, so we have from Brian. So just as, as a backdrop, um, I don't know if you ever got exposed to him, but he's uh, he has a great company, Sales Bricks. So they're in the uh, CPQ CPQ space, config yeah. price and quote. And I don't know as if GTM did. Did you guys invest? Uh, in them? No, did not. Okay, but it's a great example. They introduced us, and there's a lot that I can do to help them. You're talking about the you know advising, yeah. consulting, investing side of the thing. I invested. We've got. You know, some good synergies that uh, go in between us. And I think that that space, all sales leaders get totally fed up with how long, you know, it takes to, uh, you know, forget about the whole CPQ, just even just, you know, getting quotes out the door. So um, look for sales bricks for sure. Anyway, uh, so Brian uh, says, Max, love that aspirational group uh, comment, uh, a couple steps ahead. <laughs> and, uh, a funny comment before it says a couple ballers here, love the quarter team, quarter customer, and, you know, have prospects. It's um, you know interesting, and we're talking about doing some things with sales community and uh, you know outreach as well. But you know, I, I know of my friends; they've been uh, traveling you know for a long time. A lot of companies think, "Oh, we can't do these events; you know, people aren't going to go." But you know, from what I see of some things we've done, uh, you know, everybody certainly uh, starved uh, start for that. And, um, and and with outreach, we've kind of talked about the tech companies, but I assume that you were also 
uh, from an ICP, uh, looking at some of the non-tech companies as well, right? Because I mean, so many other industries are involved in sales and uh, leveraging outreach. Yeah, I mean, we're 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 industry agnostic. Agnostic. If, if it fits the workflow, then you know we can support it. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. Um, all right, moving on here. What about some uh, examples of sales leaders that you uh, res respect and why? Uh, you know, Mark Casaglo is the the SVP of sales now. He got his well deserved promotion recently from VP to SVP. Um, but he's pretty he's pretty uh, he's pretty fantastic. Um, I was very skeptical when he was hired. I was very skeptical <laughs> when he came into outreach and he was there. But uh, I mean, he's definitely uh, one of the better ones out there. Nobody works harder. Uh, he understands, you know, our, our sales teams and our sales leaders uh, and, and really like does the work um, so well liked across the organization um, is the probably least political person I've, I've ever met. Doesn't do any back talk doesn't do, or like or, or, or talk behind people's back. Doesn't do any of that kind of stuff ever. Uh, you know, he's just really you know, a stand-up guy with um, good core beliefs and, and, and just a good person and, um, and a hell of a sales leader. I mean, he's just done phenomenal work with our team. And, um, you know, Anna Baird, who came over uh, from the, the COO role to the CRO RO role, hopefully she'll be on the show soon enough, but uh, she's, pretty, she's pretty great too. She's um, done a really good job of bringing in the right executives uh, you know, putting the team in a place to be successful. Um, she can hold, you know, the high level conversations with, you know, other sales leaders at much larger companies, uh, very polished, very professional. And, uh, you know, uh, think, think the world of her. Um, we brought in Harish on the, on the ops side, who's been fantastic uh, addition as well. And then a lot of our kind of front and second line leaders, especially some of our homegrown people. Like it's been, it's been amazing to see over the past four years, uh, some of the folks that I, when I came in were like SDRs or AEs that are now in like sales management roles and their first mm -hmm. management roles. and they're doing really well and they're, they're, they're moving up the ranks quickly, but um, it's, it's been great. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the folks inside of uh, the outreach walls uh, for now. All right. Awesome. And uh, Brian adds, uh, Costa Glow is awesome. PSU graduate. I assume that's Penn state. Uh, Penn State just stole Patrick Kraft, our athletic director from Boston College. So we're not we're not happy with Penn State right now. But uh, anyway, uh, and uh, you know, thanks for uh, Brian chiming in. So uh, any others that are watching uh, or listening in, feel free to uh, post any comment or certainly ask any questions. Uh, you know, fantastic resource here in uh, Max from uh, Outreach. Uh, what about talking about how you've seen sales change? We got the evolving role of the CRO. You've got marketing being more tied with sales, customer success. Any perspectives there? The role of the CRO. Yeah, it's how you've seen that change. How you see marketing change? I mean, you're kind of you're you're selling. In effect, you're selling to you know those that that's your ICP, right? So you've seen you know th these roles you know kind of evolving, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the CRO is taking on more more than ever before with with you know customer success. A lot of organizations have like growth AEs, you know, uh, what you might call account managers. Uh, you know, now they're sales development teams. So I think like you know a lot of organizations have gone from having full cycle reps to breaking them out into different different groups. I mean, at Outreach, we've got an SDR, AE, AM, CEM, CSM that all touches the customer. <clears throat> you know, as a from from an IC point of view. So there's a lot of different there are a lot of different roles that have specializations. Oh, and then there's the SC. Forgot about the SC. Or in some companies, it's an SC sales engineer, solutions consultant. There are a lot of different roles that are touching the that are touching the customer and um, you know implementation specialists, all that kind of stuff. So there's when when you've got an organization transforming platform like ours, I think there's a lot of things that you do versus like a departmental tool uh, that are a little bit different. And I think you know for us, yeah, there's there is a a, a robust implementation when you bring on a, a proper sales engagement platform. Um, I think that's, you know, both the, I, I think at the end of the day, it nets out as a good thing because it makes the product better, stickier, you know, you, you actually get a lot out of it versus something you just throw in there and don't give any education around. And then people don't know how to use it. And then eventually turns out because it's getting low adoption. So the key is to, you know, have high adoption. And, um, you know, for us, we, um, for a long time, 
at the company, instead of counting users that have seats, paid seats, we would count weekly active users. Somebody who logged in and had a sales positive motion, because that's yeah. how you got the heartbeat of you know your customers and who was probably going to churn if they were just paying for seats but weren't actually you know logging in using the product. So I think as you know modern modern CCOs, CROs, CMOs, they've all got um, their work cut out for them in, in understanding like what are the new metrics we need to be tracking? What are what are the things we need to have our finger on the pulse on? I think it's um, you know the sassification of everything has changed. I think like there are new models now, consumption model, seat based pricing, PLG, where it's, you know, all right, free trial essentially that upgrades path, upgrade paths to paid or even something that allows people to pay, but swipe their credit card as an individual and then get um, wrangled together in like an enterprise license through the organization. So there are, there are a lot of different things to think about uh, for, on your go-to-market strategy. And I think it's um, more important than ever before that GTM and product are very aligned there and they're also aligned with what's happening in the marketplace. So like using your, your reps to understand, you know, what your customers and prospects are talking about and bringing that back almost in like a, a bow tie shape where there's like enablements in the middle and like both sides of the bow ties, like sales and marketing and sales, like bringing stuff back to enablement enablements, figuring out what the ask is to marketing. Marketing is getting what they need, bring it back to name enablement. Enablement is packaging back to the, to the yeah. reps enabling them. Uh, so I think that's kind of like the, the mental framework, the modern mental framework to think through it. Wow. And, uh, and, and through that, the whole kind of sales ops now kind of rev ops category has uh, grown a lot too, right? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it seems like it's always uh, evolving rev ops is <laughs> rev ops is interesting because like you used to just have like Salesforce admins. That was it. That was like the role. And then you know, in 2013, 14, 15, you started to see like VCs invest in companies for salespeople. And for a long time, like salespeople were under invested in by far. They had no budgets. Yeah. If you wanted a company to buy technology for sales that wasn't Salesforce, you had to figure out how to get marketing to pay for it. Now sales has its own budgets. It has its own, you know, teams, enablement, rev ops, sales ops, you name it. Um, it's just a much, it's a much larger group now, uh, much larger than it was before, which was like, you know, CPQ type stuff, billing and, and yeah. of course. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's great. And at the same time, there's so much tech being, being built that like RevOps has a hard job to understand, okay, like what, what do we need in our stack? What's, what's a need to have? What's a nice to have, you know, how are we making sure that, you know, the data is clean, syncing, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, that we're, we're getting good in, good out. That's great. What are, are you uh, able to comment on other sales tools <clears throat> besides outreach that you guys use? Um, I don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah, I'd rather not. <laughs> hey, my, <laughs> thing, my, you know, in my role, I have to stay very agnostic. So I don't want to be seen as um, pushing vendors over others in our space because we partner with all of them. Yeah, great. Um, and so, so technically, you're VP of Sales Engagement. I, I know you do, you know, a lot more than that. But for other people that are uh, sales engagement leaders, um, any kind of uh, ideas, uh, best practices that you'd share, or advice? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know one of the things that we focus on is our own use of outreach internally. So it's kind of like drinking our sh our own champagne. Uh, I do think that every organization that has uh, a sales team, but also that that has outreach, you should have outreach. But if you don't have outreach, if you do have outreach, um, if you don't have outreach, you get it. If you do have outreach, then, you know, it's really important, I think, that you have somebody who has like full accountability over outreaches instance or the use uh, and more, more specifically over uh, measuring the analytics that you get from uh, your insights dashboard. So, all right, these sequences are working. These sequences aren't. Here's what these teams should be using. Here's what these teams should be using. We've got content collections that allows, uh, you know, your SDR team in UK, EMEA to have one set of sequences and your AE team in, you know, APAC to have another set of sequences. There are campaigns that come out through marketing that you're going to want to have access to and, 
Like those are really important. Marketing goes, creates an ebook and spends, you know, time and money and all kinds of resources on that. And you've got reps a lot of times that are just sending out like last year's version because they can't find this year's version. So you need content collections for things like that. So there should be somebody managing an instance that's optimizing, you know, and reading, reading the data and analytics and optimizing for the reps so they don't have to do it. And the managers don't have to do it either. The managers should just do the team reporting, which is like, Hey, this, this person's activity is really low or this person isn't doing the right things. But for the most part, like the technology is there to augment and support sales reps and then like allow them to focus on the human activities that only humans can do, which is like build relationships yep. or rapport, but not have to do any of the admin work or the op optimization work or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's great. So um, time flies when you're having fun. What about uh, maybe last question for you, uh, advice that you'd give your younger self? We did an article on Sales Hacker. I think it was called like 22 Things I Wish I Knew at 22, uh, which is a really good one. And it's from like a lot of the people in the ecosystem. So that's a, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, advice for my younger self. Um, 20s are for learning, 30s are for earning. This pro was probably my, my, my number one for a very long time. Uh, I cut my teeth in my 20s. I made a lot of sacrifices in my 20s. And I, I had like, I had time set aside to enjoy my life. But like during the weeks, I was not a nine to five person. I get off at five, go to happy hour every night. Like I worked all day, Monday through Friday, and sometimes logged hours on weekends. And then, yeah, I'd go to Vegas and let it, let it, let it out for three days or something like that. But then you go back and you, you, you cut your teeth. And, you know, I think when I look at my friends who have been successful, it's proportionate to the amount of sacrifice that they did in their twenties to where they're again, like back to the analogy before planting your seeds in your twenties and harvesting them in your thirties. So for me, advice to the younger self will always be, you know, use that time, have fun, definitely have fun, but like structure your life in a way where like you've got you've got that balance set aside where it's like you're cutting your teeth and then you've earned it. You've earned the fun. And then you're cutting your teeth and you earn the fun. And not where it's like, hey, you go to work until you can't wait until 5 p.m. You go to the bar, you go home, you smoke weed, and then you sit on the couch and order an Uber Eats, and then like you wonder why you're not getting anywhere. And I, I think like that's that's not work life balance. That's not anything. It's not right. something it's it's laziness it's you know and don't complain when you're in your 30s and you haven't gotten where you want to go and that, yep. that was what you did for 10 years great yeah i guess that would be called uh, look, look look in the mirror and don't blame others probably right well <laughs> unfortunately uh, a lot of people like to blame others and not take accountability so yeah Absolutely. Anyway, um, so you've been fantastic. Really appreciate it. So uh, Max Altshuler, VP Sales Engagement and Outreach and also uh, GTM Fund. So uh, if you want to sell more, definitely check out Outreach if you want to get involved in some fantastic growing companies uh, like I am with a GTM Fund. Go check out GTM Fund. Um, if you're uh, not a member of a uh, sales community, we've got a year special going right now. So you can go to salescommunity.com slash Mayfree and uh, check that out. Uh, next week, we've got episode number 79 and have the uh, CEO of Cloud Genera, Brian Kelly. So looking forward to that. So uh, everybody have a great rest of week and uh, Tucker posts this everywhere. So uh, we, we always get lots of views. So feel free to uh, share it along. And uh, Mike chimes in with plus one on accountability. There you go. All right. Uh, well, well, Max, uh, have a great one. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you.